Good evening. Try that one more time. Good evening. There we go. Uh, well, I am not Pastor Brett, and so as you can plainly see, and I think it would be good for us to be uh, lifting him up in prayer now, and so I, I meant to check the calendars to make sure I had the right trip, but I believe he is on his way to California for Shepherd's Conference, uh, and so please be in prayer for him that this will be a time of encouragement for him, a uh, time of refreshment as he is away. Um, today we're going to be in James chapter 3. Uh, looking at the end of that chapter, verses 13 through 18. Uh, but first, I wanted to just let you know of uh, a current event situation that will lead us into our passage this evening. And it's the recent decision that took place last Monday, that was finalized last Monday by the United Methodist Church. And so there was a big decision that they came to, and so the last, last week, last Monday, and so all of last weekend, essentially, they gathered for uh, a special general conference, and they came to a decision on uh, their deciding that whole weekend on one thing. What do we do with homosexuality? And so what do we do with that in the church? Are we going to stand for uh, the traditional Methodist view and what's been written and what's been held to for, for many, many, many years? Or are we going to, to make the switch like so many other uh, mainline, even mainline Protestant denominations have gone to be more accepting of homosexuality and say it's not wrong anymore? So that decision, it was not just a decision made by the U.S. Por portion of the United Methodist Church, but this was a special general conference. So it's the worldwide church of United Methodists all gathered together to discuss this one issue. The decision that came from this special conference was to affirm that homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, the United Methodist Church is a little bit more on the liberal sides than, than even we would hold to, but they held to that decision that what we have written down in the past, we are going to hold to that now. So that was a very positive thing, uh, but it's not the decision itself that makes this story really interesting, but it's how they got to this decision. Their general conference, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, takes place every four years. Uh, and the next uh, general conference was scheduled to be held in the year 2020. And so you may be wondering, why have a special conference in the year 2019? Uh, but the liberal wing in particular of the United States kind of uh, faction of the United Methodist Church pushed for this special conference to take place in 2019. And this is something that they've been pushing for since early 2018 to make sure that this had took place just to decide this one issue. They were concerned that it would be too late if they waited for the regularly scheduled 2020 conference to have a favorable, at least on the liberal side, a favorable, de favorable decision on the accepting of homosexuality. And so they pushed for this conference to come before 2020. So why do you wonder, would it be too late? The conservative portion of the United Methodist Church generally operates outside of the United States. There are some conservative churches within the, the United States, but it's predominantly a liberal portion of the church. And so you have Africa, which, which makes up about 30% of the United Methodist Church, comes from the African nations, where in many of those nations, it's completely illegal for homosexuality to be there. They're very conservative. Then you have a lot of the Asian countries that are very similar to the African countries where it's very conservative, and those conservative portions of the church are growing faster than the liberal portion ha taking place within the United States. And so they said, if we're, we see the pendulum swinging, and if we're going to have a favorable decision, we cannot wait until 2020. We need to do it in 2019. So it was a last-ditch last effort 
to say we need to jump on uh, the moral revolution and to, to really be accepting of homosexuality within the United Methodist Church. It's the conservative church outside of the U.S. that kept the United Methodist Church from affirming homosexuality as acceptable. Now, you can read many, many comments, and I read through a few of them from both sides of the situation, uh, both sides feeling like what they pushed was right in, in the vote. I think it came down to a vote of 53% to 47%, with the 53% saying, we want to affirm that homosexuality is, is not compatible with biblical Christian teaching. So it's close. Um, uh, but that's it's very close. Both sides saying we are right in what we believe. And so both sides having very strong feelings about that. Uh, and there, I mean, it's you he hear rumors already, even though the decision just took place on Monday, of a, a significant church split taking place within the United Methodist Church just because of this one issue. So as we read those comments, both sides are stating that they are acting and have convictions that are based on wisdom. That what they are doing is right, and that they really want to, when you look 20, 40, 60 years down the road, to look back and say, we want the United Methodist Church to be on the right side of history. And right now they're saying with that decision, at least the U.S. portion is saying, we're going to look back and say, we made a mistake. We were on the wrong side of history because we know what is right. So that brings us to a question, who is acting in wisdom? And that is the first question we see in our passage that James poses for, James poses for us also. Who is being wise? An additional question that I'd like to ask and investigate today is, how can we know who is being wise. This is something we all should be concerned about, no matter if our situation is big or small that we're going through, if it's tough or it's not so bad, we need to be concerned, are we being wise in each situation we come across? Now, I want us to take a look and see what James has to tell us in chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Uh, let me read you... I'll read that for you, and I would encourage you to follow along. I am reading from uh, the ESV, and this is James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. It says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For whether jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I'd love to pray for us right now and ask that God gives us wisdom as we study this passage. Dear God, we thank you that you are the giver of wisdom. We know where wisdom comes from, and we ask tonight that you would give us wisdom to understand what your word has to tell us in this passage in James. I pray that coming out of this passage that we would make sure and, and be reassured and reaffirmed in how we are to see what is true wisdom and what is false wisdom. Dear God, I also lift up the teacher training class that is meeting tonight. I pray that you would give them wisdom Allow them to sharpen their skills in studying your words, in preparing to share your word with others as they prepare to teach in their various contexts. Uh, we thank you for the leaders of that group uh, that are desiring to help make sure that your word is being taught effectively here at Calvary Bible Church. Open our hearts to your word tonight. 
humble our hearts, and help us to be open to change. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at a few different things, one being who is wise, who does, who does James tell us is wise, and then we're going to also look at James and how he's going to explain false wisdom and true wisdom. And so he's going to look at the source of those wisdoms, he's going to look at the description of those wisdoms, and he's going to see what d comes about because of these two wisdoms, and he's going to compare and contrast a little bit, and we're going to look at that comparison. So as mentioned, James starts this passage off with a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Wisdom is not a new concept for James. In chapter 1, James tells uh, the one who lacks wisdom to ask for it from God, and it will be given to him. There are a few other sim similarities to our passage in that beginning part of uh, James, and we're going to explore a little bit of that later, but we know that wisdom is important to James. Even this little introduction and looking back at that passage to James chapter 1, uh, our, our faith at home class that was going over prayer this morning, and in the last two weeks, this is a passage that they have referred to, the James chapter 1, and we're going to kind of look at how that relates to our James chapter 3 but looking at, man, when we are worrying about our parenting, I mean, prayer is a huge part of that. And prayer, it's, it's going to God and saying, God, I need wisdom because I have no clue what to do with these kids. I remember the first time that I held our oldest child in my arms in the hospital. The very first time I held them, I looked and said, what in the world are we doing? I have no clue what I'm supposed to be doing. There's no instructions that come with this. And so they give you little things in the hospital that are so overwhelming. And so you come on your knees before the Lord and say, I need your wisdom. What we know is that wisdom is very important to James. His answer to this question about who is wise, who has understanding, shouldn't surprise us either. Those who are wise show it through their works. James tells us in the second half of, half of verse 13, By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. James is telling us here that wisdom is displayed in a lifestyle. He's not just saying that these works will serve as evidence, but he's also calling out to those who claim to be wise. And he's saying, hey, let him show. The person that claims to be wise, let him show his wisdom through his works. Let him show his wisdom through his lifestyle. Your works will show whether you have true or false wisdom. And that's a lot of what James gets into later in this passage. Throughout the book up to this point, James has been very concerned with works. Chapter 1 discusses both being steadfast in trials and doing the word rather than just hearing it. James 2 goes over a significant focus on faith without works is dead. Again, he's not saying that saving faith is obtained through works, but the natural outcome for one who is truly saved is to have works that you can see. Earlier, even in chapter 3, we see the importance of taming the tongue so only blessings come out rather than cursings. James is concerned with people living out their faith. It's a very practical book. He loves to give you and say, this is how the Christian life is to be lived. That's a big focus he has. James gives wisdom an interesting modifier at the end of verse 13. He states that the works to be shown should be shown in, we, uh, in wisdom of meekness. Now, Pastor Brett has recently given us a really good explanation of meekness. Uh, and so I'm not going to take the time to really unpack that, but it's really just a quick summary is to have power under control. That power under control, and we'll look at that a little bit later as we see a little bit more about true wisdom. In fact, James, as we look at this wisdom of meekness, gives the opposite of this in verse 14 when he discusses 
bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition. Those two phrases are interesting, and we should find them convicting. Pairing the word bitter with jealousy really gives it an idea of sharpness or extreme jealousy. This jealousy only cares for oneself and doesn't care or doesn't think twice about those whom it hurts. This is contrasted to true wisdom. This jealousy is generally driven by the selfish ambition that we see or significant selfishness. If we claim to have wisdom and yet display these attributes, we are being false to the truth. Both of these terms show up later, and we're going to give them more attention, attention in their later contexts. The contrast between meekness of wisdom and bitter jealousy and selfish ambition sets up a contrast between two types of wisdom for the rest of this passage. In verses 14 through 18, we see James contrasting false and true wisdom. As he contrasts the two wisdoms, he addresses the source the description, and the effects of each of those wisdoms. James starts with false wisdom in verses 15 through 16. I'm going to reread that kind of as a, a little reminder. So verses 15 and 16 says this, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. James makes it clear that jealousy and selfish ambition are not wisdom that come from above. Instead of coming from above, he tells us that the source of this wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. This wisdom, now this is wisdom, but it's wisdom of a different kind. I want to take a quick look at these three terms. Earthly wisdom is wisdom that is restricted to the physical, temporary world. It does not generally have positive connotations. It is described uh, as being of low quality. It's kind of more of a neutral, and so not necessarily never really used as positive, but generally of low quality. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 49, makes a distinction between the earthly body and the spiritual body, and so our physical bodies. The earthly body is a temporary body made of dust that will give way to the spiritual body upon resurrection. We are to look forward to the shedding of our earthly, temporary body for a heavenly one. A spiritual one. The second term that's given is unspiritual. It transitions from this low quality, kind of neutral word being that earthly, to one that specifically relates to the fallen condition of man. This wisdom described in the fallen nature is separated from God. So it's no longer neutral, just temporary, something that's going to be shed, but it's something that is separated from God, cannot be with God. It is not of God. It characterizes the one who is a worldly-minded person. Going back to 1 Corinthians again in chapter 2, verse 14, we see that this, uh, this unspiritual word uh, often describes an unspiritual person that does not accept the things of God because he believes them to be foolish. I mean, it's no longer neutral. It's against, and it thinks the things of God are foolish. Unspiritual wisdom, that source, sees things, the things of God as foolish. The third source of wisdom that's described as not from above is demonic. Here we see that the root of wisdom that's not from above is Satan. This wisdom is complete deception. We can think of Eve in the garden and the wisdom that was promised to her by the serpent. She was her, to have her eyes opened and to be like God. Paul was concerned again for the Corinthians in this area when he reminded them of Eve and the garden in 2 Corinthians 11. 
He warns them not to be deceived and gives a chilling caution. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It's not the situations that are overtly wrong that we should necessarily be most worried about. Those, hopefully, unless we are very calloused to the things of the Lord, when we see those overtly wrong things, our natural reaction is to say, oh, stay away from that. But it's the things that are partially true, or maybe even mostly true, that have a little bit of falsehood to them that we need to be concerned about. Those are deceptions that grow, and that's demonic wisdom. After James tells us the source of false wisdom, he shares the description of false wisdom. As we saw before, he describes false wisdom as jealousy and selfish ambition. False wisdom is present when there is a focus on us. Look at the world around you. Where do we see this false wisdom present? Where are we be de being deceived by false wisdom? Is it in our jobs where we do what we can to get a promotion? Or maybe we're not even concerned about a promotion. We do what we can just to have the job because we see others getting laid off around us. So we are concerned with ourselves and we do what we can and maybe curb some of the edges because we're concerned, because I've got a family to provide for. I have responsibilities, so I need to do what I can in my power to make sure that I have this job. We're going to see that that is a direct contrast between spiritual wisdom and depending on, on God the Father for that wisdom, or depending on our own wisdom, our own actions for our needs. Is it on the road when we get frustrated, when someone pulls out in front of us and cuts us off? Now, I need to be careful because this is, can be a source topic for me at times. And it's something I'm sure Kelly, who, who left at an appropriate time to take my daughter somewhere, um, is probably saying, yes, Jeremy, you need to preach this to yourself. Are we concerned with ourselves in giving people what they deserve or what we think they deserve? So it's that jealousy in making sure that I come first. I am the priority. And that selfish ambition to say, I need to get where I'm going at your expense. Is it in our parenting when we say we're too tired to fulfill that God-given role that he has given to us? Is it in our marriage when we're only concerned about what we want rather than serving our spouse? I even heard recently that uh, we shouldn't care necessarily about what we desire from the marriage. We shouldn't even necessarily care primarily about what our spouse desires in marriage, but we should first and foremost care about what God desires for our marriage. And so we're multiple steps away from that when we're going to our, our marriage and saying, I'm primarily concerned with what I can get out of it from what it's going to serve me to be in that marriage. James continues, and he shows us the effects of false wisdom. He simply describes the effects of false wisdom as disorder and every vile practice. James has spoken of this type of disorder before. In James chapter 1, verse 8, he describes the double-minded man. This is instability, confusion, and rebellion. And again, this goes back to the wisdom if you look in James chapter 1. And it says, if you lack wisdom, you need to ask God for wisdom. But if you ask God, you need to trust that he's going to give it to you and trust on that wisdom. This disorder or this instability is wavering back and forth and saying, oh, I've got it. This is an easy situation. I've, I've got the tools. I can do this myself. And then saying, oh, no, I, I need to bring this to, to God in prayer. Or maybe it's, man, I've tried everything I've gotten to, and I'm at the, my end, so now I need to come to God in prayer. No, it's kind of going back and saying, oh, I've got it, or, or God took care of a little bit, now I can go back to being in control because I've got the tools to solve the situation. 
That's this disorder, this wavering going back and forth. He says that is not true wisdom. That is a description of false wisdom where you're leaning on your own understanding. This is the opposite of how God is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, which says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. That confusion is that wavering, that unsettledness. That's not who God is. He's not a God of that confusion, but a God of peace. We're going to see later in this passage, peace comes up multiple times. It is in the description of what true wisdom is. It is the effect and what comes about when true wisdom is in place and when we're depending on the Lord. God is a God of peace. The other effects that every vile practice, that's the second effect of false wisdom. And it's a very broad turn. I mean, if you just look at every vile practice, I mean, you think, whoa, I mean, that's, that's a lot, of, lot going on there. But another way that we could describe this would be every worthless result that comes from human wisdom. Every worthless result that comes from human wisdom. There may be things that just aren't good, but it's just in the long run, that's worthless. Worthless, re worthless results that comes from human wisdom. Elsewhere in the Bible, this term is used to contrast the saved from the unsaved. John chapter 5, verse 29, just fo that follows a discussion of the end judgment, and it says this, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Ultimately, the end result of false wisdom is eternal judgment by God. Now, discussion about false wisdom is very harsh. I mean, you go through this, and it's like, this does not sound very positive. But it's not something we can just gloss over. It is something that we need to take a look at in our own lives and find areas where we are being deceived just as Eve was deceived. She was going about her business thinking it was okay until God came and said, that was wrong. Obviously, when their eyes were opened, they immediately knew it was wrong. And so the same is often with us. We need to be careful so we are not deceived because often when it ends up going, we go through it and it happens, we know we are wrong. We need to see where we settle for less than what God's word calls for. I'd love for you to investigate the desires of your heart. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 is a common passage that says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The heart is important. James warns us in our passage about having bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in our hearts. What is your treasure? Is your reason for working to have more and better of what this world has to offer? You're being deceived. Are you in your marriage for what you can get out of it? You are being deceived. Does your dedication, maybe to athletics or to any other hobby, go beyond and more important than anything else? You are being deceived. These areas and many more will lead to much disorder and worthlessness. For me, it's a joy that James doesn't end this passage with this false wisdom. He moves now into the source, description, and effects of true wisdom. Let's review verses 17 and 18. It says this, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a, good, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Verse 17 gives us the source of true wisdom when it says, the wisdom from above. Wisdom from above. It's wisdom that God gives us. It's not temporary. It's not earthly. It's not human. It's not from Satan. 
but it's wisdom coming from God. In chapter 1, verse 5, we see that God is the giver of wisdom. James tells us again, that review that when we lack wisdom, we can ask God and he will give wisdom to us. The wisdom from above is not merely knowledge, but it involves action. In chapter 1, James encourages us to be a doer and not only a hearer. In chapter 2, he warns us that we have dead faith if it, is, if it does not produce works. Wisdom from above leads to action. James then gives us a description of what this true wisdom looks like. In this list, we see one attribute stands out from above the rest. James makes a point to say wisdom from above is first pure. Then he lists the other qualities. He wanted to emphasize this first quality before the others. The, this wisdom is pure, unstained, undefiled, uncontaminated. This purity and wisdom is a reflection of who God is and what we should strive to be. The purity lets nothing creep in. None of this earthly wisdom is infiltrating. After mentioning purity, James continued with a long list of what true wisdom is. Now, we don't have time to really dive deep into each of these descriptions, but it's interesting to look at why he chose many of these qualities. He mentions peaceable, which is in contrast to jealousy. We've already seen peace come, and we see it here again, and we're going to see it again later in the passage. Instead of being uncaring in who you hurt, you desire to live in peace. This reinforces Jesus' message in Matthew 5, 9, when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers. Now, this is something that we desire a lot in our family because I have four kids. And so, and they're, they're all pretty close in age and they like to be with each other. And there are a lot of times when it is not peaceful in our home. But one of Kelly's goals and one thing she tells to me all the time is, Jeremy, we need to be peacemakers. A lot of times that is not my wisdom, my earthly wisdom coming through to be a peacemaker. I just want things quiet sometimes. And so it's a lot of times where I need to come and say, God, I need your wisdom to be a peacemaker in these situations. There's a lot of times, even in the church, where we say, man, we have difference of opinion on certain things, where we really need to try hard to be peacemakers. We need to say, God, I can't do this by myself because I don't think the same way that they do. I need you to help me be a peacemaker. Peacemaking. That's what true wisdom is. True wisdom is to be gentle. This reiterates the meekness in wisdom that we saw earlier. This ring true also in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, when he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When I think of being gentle, I think of uh, my when we had... Our, our fourth child, our third daughter, born. And so when we had this little tiny one, and then our third child just wanted to smother this little one with love. And I remember so often coming and saying, gentle, gentle. And so, and then taking her hand and just stroking the cheek of our newborn baby and saying, this is what gentle looks like. Now, in taking her hand and doing that, was I completely taking the strength out of her arm. No. Did she still have the ability to inflict great harm on that little one? Yes. She had the strength because the little ones are more fragile. And so that I was trying in her to get that strength under control so it communicated love to her little sister. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In gentleness, we, we have different strengths, and we can use those strengths and bash people over the head with that and say, this is what you need to do. But that's not received very well, and that's not true wisdom. What we need to do is control 
that strength that we have, come alongside people in gentleness and communicate that in love. True wisdom is to be gentle. True wisdom is also to be open to reason. It is to willingly submit to the standards God gives us without disputing. Willingly submit. It's a military term where it's saying you will willingly submit to the demands that's given to you. And he says that's what we need to do with God. That's true wisdom when we willingly submit ourselves to him. This also reflects Jesus' message in Matthew 5, chapter 3, when he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit have submitted their spirit to God and allowing him to lead them. True wisdom is to be full of mercy. This mercy is direct opposite of selfish ambition. This also reflects Jesus' message in Matthew 5, 7, when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I think about this in the driving illustration and someone cutting you off. You can say, you deserve to be honked at, so I'm going to honk at you. You deserve for me to let you know that I felt that was inappropriate. Or we can have mercy and say, I see this person weaving in and out. I'm going to back off and not give them what I think they deserve, but I'm just going to give them grace. I'm going to give them mercy. I'm going to allow them to go before me, put others first, even if I don't think they deserve it. Mercy instead of jealous and selfish ambition. True wisdom is full of good fruits. It is full of genuine faith being displayed by good works. And so I feel like these are like a summary of everything that you read up to this point in the book of James. This is also reflected in, in that Matthew 5 passage, verse 6, which says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the verse that was on my mind when many years ago, in working with middle school, we started Crave, where we said, I want students to crave righteousness. And here, looking at the context, it is a life that honors God. They hunger and thirst after doing actions and works that honors the Lord. They want everything they do to be pleasing to the Lord. Hunger and thirst for that righteousness. It's full of good fruits. True wisdom is to be impartial. This word used in this context carries out an understanding of being undivided. And it's that opposite of the double-minded man who is unstable in all his wise ways that we already mentioned from chapter 1. Impartial, undivided. you got got undivided attention. There's also, I mean, James talks about uh, being impartial earlier as it relates to people and says, don't show favoritism. Be constant in how you treat everybody the same with the same grace. True wisdom is sincere. This tells us and carries the idea that true wisdom is not hypocritical. This reflects James' focus on our actions being a product of our faith. If we have true wisdom, it will flow out in our actions. Twice in, twice in Matthew chapter 6, again looking at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns against this hypocrisy. Now it's amazing and interesting that all but one of these attributes that we looked at can be found in the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a lot of these correlations brought together. Jesus was calling his listeners to the same wisdom that James is writing about. Jesus was giving firsthand wisdom from above. James wanted to make sure that we didn't miss that wisdom. True wisdom is carried, carried out by the Holy Spirit and his presence in our lives. These attributes should characterize our lives. Paul ends this section with the effects of true wisdom. This last phrase that we see in verse 18 is pretty difficult to understand exactly what James is trying to get at. 
Uh, and many commentators have differing views on exactly what he means by it. Uh, but what many, as they look through it, really seem to agree upon is the idea that a peacemaker will reap righteousness when he sows in an atmosphere of peace. So when someone that really desires that peace, and so he's going to reap righteousness, a life that honors the Lord's, when he sows actively in peace. This verse says, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, there's a, a correlation between wisdom, peace, and, and our righteousness, our actions. And so in making sure that we have a life that pleases the Lord. Does true wisdom characterize our lives? Do these descriptions match our lives when it comes to family, our work, our marriage, our church? Both this morning and last week, our Faith at Home prayer class mentors made a comment that really stuck with me. They said, prayer in hard situations or easy situations needs to be your first resort. Small situations, the first thing you do is go to prayer. Big situations, hurdles come, maybe big health issues. The first thing we do is we need to go to prayer. That's saying, I want God's wisdom. That's the first thing we do. We don't first say, how do I work this out? What can I do to make my situation better? Far too often, we try to work out these situations with our limited human wisdom before we bring it to the Lord. The focus of the class was modeling a life of prayer and dependence on the Lord. A main thrust, especially of, of last week in that class, was that you won't value prayer until you get to the point that you realize you're not ultimately in control. There are so many things that we try to control, but it's not until you get to the point where you think, I'm not ultimately in control, so I really need to be turning to the one who really is in control. We rely on earthly wisdom when we think we are in control. We turn to heavenly wisdom when we surrender to his control. My closing urge is for you that you will not dismiss this passage too quickly because you feel this only pertains to others. Just like Eve was deceived, there can be times where we are deceived and we really need to search our hearts. Far too often we fall to failure with this in the area of church and home. We are blind to it because we have been deceived by wisdom that does not come from above. It breaks my heart especially when someone from this body of believers or other bodies of believers feel so open to criticize another believer or decisions that the elders make in prayer or decisions the pastors make in prayer because they feel like they know better and they, they just parade it around rather than me being that peacemaker and coming and saying, hey, Let's discuss this. Doesn't mean we don't disagree, but it's the way in which we disagree and move forward. I've heard too many stories about believers here or in other churches that have a dislike with someone or something in the church, and they say comments such as, haven't you heard people don't like X, Y, or Z? And they've been talking about it for months, and some are ready to leave the church. Those situations are a result of wisdom that is not from above. Rather than producing peacemakers, it produces disorder in every vile practice. Again, I strongly encourage that doesn't mean we don't disagree. doesn't mean we don't understand. But what it means is as a peacemaker, we go and say, I don't understand this. Help me understand it so I can be a peacemaker with others that don't understand <coughs> this is something we all need to be guarding against. We need to strive to be peacemakers in the church, strive to be peacemakers in our homes, and strive to be peacemakers out there in the world as we rely on wisdom that can only come from above. Let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful that you give us wisdom. 
You don't leave us to our own and to ourself and to our own thoughts, but you give us wisdom. Dear God, we don't have all the wisdom we need, and there are many times we find us, ourselves falling short on great wisdom that we need in hard situations. Help us to remember that our first resort is to fall on our knees before you. If there's an issue going on with health that we don't know what to do, an issue going on with a family member that we don't know how to resolve, an issue going on with a hard marriage that we don't know how to get through this impasse, an issue that's going on with another church member, help us to come to you and say, God, give me wisdom to be a peacemaker. Dear God, we love you dearly, and we want to be peacemakers in your church so that you can do great things through this body. We love you, and I pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.